Being a programmer, one of my dreams has always been to create an original video game, something that nobody in the industry has done before. After seeing Spore, I became intrigued. Here was an attempt at putting people in control over a universe. After looking at what made video games popular, I realized the main aspect was control. People in their daily lives have no control over their environment. They are told what to do, where to go, and how to live. Their jobs consist of standing or sitting somewhere until it's 5 p.m. and they're allowed to head back home. It's no wonder they're unhappy. For many people, video games are an escape to a world where they are in control or live exciting alternate lives filled with adventure. The aspect of control is generally found in strategy games and the adventure in role-playing games. I looked at games like The Sims and noticed what made them so popular is not just the illusion of control, but the degree of control. In that game, the players have complete control over people's lives. Before The Sims, there was Sim Earth, a game in which you do not control individual people, but an entire Earth. I came to the conclusion that I had to develop a game similar to Spore, in which the player suddenly guides evolution. What caused Spore to be such a failure is the lack of realistic control people had. It hardly resembled evolution. To do this, I began by generating a physics system. I know little about physics, but decided to study it and try to create a simplified version in which certain particles can interact in specific manners. When it comes down to it, physics is simply complex mathematics. I simulated energy and matter and created a simple system with a sun emitting energy circled by a planet catching said energy. I decided to create simple basic cells from scratch that were hard-coded, so to speak, in the system I was designing. They lived off of the energy emitted by the sun and had a genetic code that coded for the substances produced by the cells. I guess you could call them my eukaryotes. My world, within a few minutes, would always fill with these cells, after which they would mutate, and the most efficient cell in converting energy from the sun into useful substances for division would survive. It was very boring, but it worked, I guess. I decided to expand the physics system and force the cells to create waste products that were toxic and would kill them. I noticed some cells responded to this by producing less waste. Others responded by producing something to emit the waste. Yet others developed chemicals to clean up the waste products. However, I noticed something fascinating. Running the simulation for a few centuries a few minutes in real life, created cells that made massive amounts of specific waste products on purpose. I noticed that other cells died as a result of this, to which the other cells responded by usurping the building blocks they had created from energy. The first predators were born. With the first predators, diversity in this little world rapidly increased. Some grew a response to flee when they encountered these toxins, Others grew resistance to them. The ones that grew resistance would eventually grow to utilize the toxin's products. Eventually I noticed something interesting. The cells that escaped from the toxin grouped up with the cells that utilized the toxins. They stayed close together and helped each other out. Eventually these types of cells would attach to one another. They formed a weird symbiosis where the cell that would normally flee would now move toward places where the toxins are, and the other cell would consume the toxins and provide the mover with some of the energy. Without going into too much detail, I became very excited and decided to let the simulation run during the morning. I had stayed up until 5 a.m. while I went to bed. When I woke up at around 11, I noticed the world I had created had changed and was barely recognizable. Massive plant-like structures grew in this world, consumed by other organisms that ate these plants. 
However, looking at the log, I noticed the world hadn't changed much in the past two hours or so. I had reached another stasis point, where the simplicity of my simulation prevented more complex life from evolving. I expanded the system by breaking up energy into different types with different wavelengths that were absorbed to different degrees by different molecules. I implemented vibrations in the air, created an improved simulation of weight, and made some more minor tweaks. This caused the simulation to run slower, of course, but it was worth the sacrifice. I stayed around the whole day watching the simulation in excitement and playing with it, as it was incredibly addicting. Complex organisms evolved that cooperated, Plants that depended on each other, or attracted predators that ate the horrible-looking creatures that ate from them. I had fun and noticed that some creatures evolved warning calls. This means that if they noticed a predator, they would issue a sound, and all others of their kind would flee into holes they had dug in the earth. Others evolved mating calls. I decided to have some fun. I made a dump tool, allowing me to dump specific organisms on the earth and wrote my name with it. I created ten meteorites and dumped them on a piece of land to create an island because I wanted to see whether the animals stuck on both sides would evolve in different directions. I made a smiley island with volcanic eruptions. By that time, I realized I had stayed up until 5 a.m. again as I heard the birds outside. I felt tired again and I woke up at about 1 p.m. or so. When I looked at my simulation again, I felt a sense of shock. Different groups of animals in one species had made statues with stones, some in the form of a smiley, some in the form of my name. I didn't know why they were doing this or how. What I did notice is that they would attack each other from time to time. I didn't know what to do with it, but I concluded that these organisms must have somehow noticed that the smiley and the name I had written were special. The fighting disturbed me, and so I decided to create a massive mountain ridge through volcanic eruptions to separate the two groups. By this time, changes were happening fast compared to earlier. While I had to spend a night sleeping to see tribes evolve in my simulation while I was getting something to eat or take a bathroom break, I would notice the tribesmen wearing different styles of clothing or having changed their type of dwelling. Their numbers were also continually increasing. At some point, I noticed the creatures began making their own symbols on the ground and no longer just copying mine. Most of the symbols seemed random and unintelligible to me, but one stood out. The organisms had created a symbol that resembled them a small circle with a square beneath it. Within the square, a dot could be found in the center. This was meant to symbolize the visual organs of the creature, as the creature had two visual organs, one in the front of its body and one in the back. In the square, other sensory and reproductive organs were symbolized. Next to the circle on top of the square could be seen something resembling a drawing of a fork, Two of these forks had been painted in opposite directions, and next to that smiley face could be seen. I realized something. They were not communicating towards each other. They were trying to communicate to something out there. My meddling in their landscape had somehow made them realize that something powerful was out there, capable of changing their world. I wondered whether symbols like Stonehenge and the pyramids in my own world could be signs of primitive people trying to do the same thing, begging their creator or overseer to initiate contact with them. However, one thing was undeniable by now. These creatures realized there's something out there. I wondered long, did I have a responsibility to initiate contact with something that isn't real, Or are these creatures real in a different way? Can something be real merely by being capable of having a concept of itself? And even if they are real, does that mean they'll be better off with me initiating contact with them? 
Should I change my simulation to ensure them permanent happiness? And is it even possible for me to do such a thing? I did not want to confirm my existence to them, but I did want to be able to communicate with them. I decided to program a prophet, an organism that looks like them and cannot be proven by them to be different from themselves and is fully controlled by me. I let it be born into a powerful position as the son of a leader. I decided to lead by example and seek to teach these creatures English so I could communicate with them. As prophet, I instructed them that English was the language we would use to communicate with the greater one. They would have no way to be sure if it was true or not. I hadn't made up my mind yet about whether I would reveal myself or not, but I did want to be capable of understanding what they wanted to tell me. In a few generations, they all spoke English, and rapidly signs began emerging on the ground in English. Guide us. Show your greatness. Help us. And during times of disease or hunger or general misery, give us food. Show us a miracle. End our suffering. I decided that I couldn't maintain a world with such suffering as emerged in the simulation without intervening. Why would I accept a world with death and rape and murder if I could make one without it? I implemented fixes that were gradual so they could not be proven to be miraculous. Murder and rape would over the years become rarer, and so would death at a young age. I figured that they would not notice if the change happened over generations, but they did. Thank you. All blessings be upon the greatest. We love you. And, most heartbreaking, come back to us. Tears ran over my face. There is something there, and it knows I am here, able to contact them but unwilling to do so out of fear of what I've created. But I also felt I had a responsibility. And so I loaded up the character I had created again and went to their king, asking to talk to all of their wisest men. But by this time, I was not believed. You are number 1341, claiming to be an avatar of the greatest one. If you are him, I pray for your forgiveness, but please show us a sign before demanding of me to gather all our wisest men. And so I hesitated, but responded. Tomorrow there shall be two more meteors following on a deserted island in the sea before you on the same day. And when they do, doubt no more and realize that I have come back to repair the broken world that I have created. And so I exited my avatar and progressed the simulation until the next day was reached and threw two meteors on the deserted island before the mainland where thousands had gathered to watch whether a sign would be given. Upon the descent of the meteors, celebrations were held. All the sentient organisms gathered around the small house where I had exited my avatar and lay flat on the ground in apparent worship of the man who was last seen there, and afraid of coming close. I don't know who was more afraid by now, me or them. I loaded into my avatar again and exited the house. The creatures continued to lay flat on the ground in utter silence. It is as if they felt unworthy of speaking. Let your wisest man stand up, I told them. And up stood one of these bizarre-looking creatures. Thank you for coming back. Pray tell us, do you have any requests of us? I hesitated before saying, There is nothing you can do for me that pleases me, but for you to be good to one another, and to contact me with your wishes and fears. And the creature responded, We know you come from a different world, and we are afraid. We understand how vulnerable we are and how incomplete our experience is. Please, allow us to join you in the world that you created our world from. I began crying behind my computer as I responded, I do not know how. 
The creature responded, At risk of offending you, please understand the severity of our situation. By living in a world that is incomplete, we are at constant risk of disappearing forever, never to be seen again. We would never even consciously realize that our end had come. I realized that they were unable to comprehend that I only had absolute power within their own world and not outside of it. They also did not realize that my knowledge of their world was limited. I may have created it through simple laws, but those simple laws gave way to a reality of its own that is more complex than I can comprehend. I responded again, I only have power in your world. In my world I have no power, and so I cannot bring you there because my world is not under my control. I also do not understand the world I have created. I do not know what is best for you. Only you do, and you have to inform me what you want. And the man waited for a moment. I was about to think they were going to end communicating with me, before their wisest man responded, You have created a world that is incomplete, with creatures that cannot escape it, and you have no power to save them. They are completely unfree, and they have no power. We are completely at your mercy, and so we ask you from the deepest of our heart, End us. By now I was crying as I was confused and asked to do the impossible. My own child was asking me to kill it. This is when I noticed the lights in my room flickering before my computer suddenly shut down. I screamed. Upon trying to turn on my computer again, I noticed it wasn't working. I called the power company, who told me that due to an accident, a power surge had traveled through the grid. They promised me they would pay me for any damage done. I hung up and contemplated. The coincidence of what had just happened was too great to be imaginable. And I wondered, if these creatures were at the mercy of a confused creator, could the same be said of me? And if so, did my creator just prevent me from repeating his own mistake? Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to listen to this story in its entirety. If you've enjoyed what you've heard and would like to support me and my efforts, hit the like button and do not forget to subscribe and turn on notifications today. And please share this video with everyone on your social media. With just a few clicks, you can help this channel grow and reach new listeners. You can also support me by subscribing to my podcast scary stories told in the dark, with dozens of episodes available now. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com for more details today. For exclusive, ad-free extended episodes of my program, including stories you won't find here on YouTube, visit chillingtalesfordarknights.com slash join and sign up as a patron today or pick up a season pass for my show. Lastly, if you'd like to contribute directly, you can support me with donations at patreon.com. Just visit patreon.com slash Otis Gyrie. That's patreon.com slash O-T-I-S-J-I-R-Y. Thanks again for listening and for your support. Have a great day and God bless you.